All right, um, we'll go ahead and get started now, just mindful of the time. Good morning, everybody, and good evening to Natalie and those of you who are joining us from the other side of the world. I hope everyone is staying well and healthy uh, at this time. And welcome to the second series of the HK45 virtual fireside chat. My name is Kitty, and I'm an associate at Sherman and Sterling's arbitration group. And I'm also a newly minted member of the HK45 committee. I'm sure many of you are already very familiar with HK45, but for those of you joining us for the first time, HK45 is a professional group for young arbitration practitioners, which is formed under the auspice of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. Our core mission is to provide a platform for young practitioners to connect with and learn from other leading professionals in the field, such as through an event like today. Although usually we will be gathered in the same room, perhaps with a real fireplace, and most likely with cocktails on the side as well. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, the upside of virtual events is that it also enables us to invite a wider range of speakers and audience from all around the world who otherwise may not be able to join us here in Hong Kong. So to join HK45, you don't have to be under the age of 45 or be based in Hong Kong for that matter. Our membership is free and we welcome everyone who is young or young at heart and passionate about international arbitration. A major part of our work is to promote diversity in arbitration. And we are very proud to present you the second Fireside Chat series which showcase top female practitioners in the field. Through this type of events, we hope that uh, both our female and uh, male audience will be able to relate to the experience shared by our speakers, feel inspired by their stories and become more confident in pursuing your own career path. We are extremely honored to have Natalie Reed with us today. Natalie is a partner at Double Voice and Plimpton based in New York, and we look forward very much to hearing about her experience and insight from an exemplary career in international arbitration as well as public international law. We are also very proud to have Stella Hu, who will be interviewing Natalie today. Stella is a senior consultant at, at Herbert Smith Freehills, and she was also a member of the HK45 committee for the past two years. Um, also, as part of the second series, we'll be having Sapna Jangjiani, who is a partner at Clyde and Co. in Singapore, to chat with us on January 29. Um, and then on February 5th, we will have Yas Banifatemi, who is, of course, the global co head of Sherman's arbitration practice. So please stay tuned, sign up for our mailing list if you haven't done so, and uh, look out for our email with the registration information we will, which will be sent out in due course. So without any further ado, I will now hand over to Stella to kick off the interview. Stella. Thanks, Kitty. And good morning and good evening, everyone. And um, this is a great honor for me to have this opportunity to interview Ms. Natalie Reed. Uh, she's an expert in international commercial um, and investment state arbitration, an expert on public international law. And she has multiple leadership roles, significant ones, including the board members of LCIA, president of S LCIA North America Users Council, a member of ICC Com uh, Commission on Arbitration and ADR, and she has been recognized by leading, leading legal directories for her outstanding experience in international arbitration. Chambers Global 2020 has described her as a gem in terms of talent, knowledge, and approach for case. And Legal 500 US 2020 recommends her as the next generation partner. So now let me bring you Miss Natalie Reed. Thank you very much, Stella. And Hi, Natalie. 45. <laughs> It is a pleasure to join you this morning, this evening, this afternoon, wherever we are in the world. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, uh, before I start my questions, I'll just give um, the audience um, a preview of what we are going to do today. So, so as an interviewer, I'm going to ask basically Natalie three sections of questions covering her early career, her current career, 
her valuable advice on an international arbitration and the dispute resolution. And finally, some advice to our young generation of um, um, arbitration practitioners. So we hope we can uh, finish our interview in, within 40 to 50, um, uh, 40, 40 minutes, and then we leave some time for people to ask questions. So if you have any questions, use the Q&A chat function in the Zoom, and then we can and collect questions and then see whether, whether Natalie can answer at the end. And so, Natalie, if you have your favorite cup of tea with you, then we will start. <laughs> um, so my quest, first question is, what made you decide to study law as a student? And uh, if you had not gone into law, what would you have done? So I grew up in Jamaica and uh, it's based on the British educational system. So basically by the time you're about 12 or 13, you're supposed to begin to figure out what you want to do for the rest of your life. So I, I took um, one of those aptitude tests that spat out, spat out a bunch of questions and the result was I was supposed to be a lawyer. And at the same time, uh, I had begun to meet members of the diplomatic corps in Jamaica. And I, I couldn't believe, again, as a 12 year old, that there was a job where you could travel the world and learn foreign languages and people paid you to do that. So I put the two together and I decided that I wanted to be an international lawyer again, at 12 years old, not really knowing what that was, or even if such a career actually existed. Um, to my great good fortune, it turns out there is such a thing. Um, it actually uh, matched very well with my own academic and professional interests. Um, so many, many years later, I, I am lucky enough to have built a career um, in that field. So uh, if I hadn't gone into law, if for some reason um, that aptitude test had spat out some other answer, I probably would have gone into the diplomatic service because the lure of that foreign travel and foreign languages wow. as a job was pretty strong. Wow, that was amazing experience at 12. Where did you travel to? Oh, so um, again, as a, as a West Indian, um, again, I, I, I grew up, um, I'm Jamaican, my mother's Trinidadian, and Trinidadians have this phrase that if you like to travel a lot, they say that you have hot feet or a hot foot. So we would, you know, sort of travel throughout the, the Caribbean, travel to the United States, travel to the United Kingdom, and I knew that there was the rest of the world out there that was waiting for me. Wow, that's amazing. Well, that's a very exciting start of your career at 12. Um, my next question is, um, in your, is your actual experience being a successful lawyer anywhere different from what you have imagined where you were, you were a student or you first started this job? Uh, very much so. Um, when I was a student in uh, university and law school, my first year of law school, I was convinced that if you wanted to practice international law, that you had to be in the public sector, that firms didn't really have uh, public international law practice. I was aware of international arbitration, but here's one of my secrets. I never actually studied international arbitration when I was in law school. Um, so uh, for me, the, what I was aiming for was somewhere that I could practice public mm -hmm. international law in the first place. So uh, if you had told me when I was in law school that I would end up X number of years later, for now, I'll just leave that X un unquantified, um, as a, a partner in a law firm, a commercial law firm, uh, practicing international disputes, including public international law and international arbitration, I would have laughed in your face because I was convinced that no such thing existed. Um, so uh, certainly the actual experience of what I do now uh, is far broader, uh, richer, more challenging, uh, more rewarding than I would have imagined when I was in law school. Mm, mm, mm. I didn't do international, study international arbitration law either. <laughs> See, um, there you go, that's the first secret. So yeah, open your people. imaginations, there is a lot there. <laughs> um, so my original next question, I probably have um, answered, why did you decide to be a dispute lawyer? Um, maybe you have covered. So, yeah, so um, uh, I, and this may also have been sort of a lack of imagination. Um, when I thought of public international law, um, uh, I couldn't imagine it being anywhere except in the contentious sphere, because mm -hmm. I was most interested in, you know, kind of the naughtiest questions, um, not, not like naughty <laughs> as in difficult. Um, uh, and for me, the sphere in which all of that would be resolved would be in the context of an actual dispute. 
Um, so mm -hmm. I, I never really uh, contemplated once I did, you know, figured out that I, I wanted to, to be where, at the cutting edge of international law, I never really considered uh, anything that wasn't in a dispute setting. Um, uh, that said, one of the things that um, when I first started out uh, on, on this uh, career path, um, that some of my, you know, sort of uh, uh, friends and colleagues in law school um, sort of uh, pushed me on was to say, you know, sort of, are you sure that you have the right temperament to be a disputes lawyer? You know, sort of, you really like to spend a lot of time in the library, you get, you know, so caught up in these, you know, sort of very, very precise questions. Um, you know, sort of, are, are you really the kind of person who is going to become an advocate? Um, and uh, uh, in, in the beginning, I kind of brushed it off and, and didn't really think that much about it. Um, and then once I began practicing, saw that that was in some ways um, really just uh, uh, reflective of, frankly, a challenge that women uh, face frequently mm -hmm. in our field. Um, that there is, for better or worse, and in my view, more for worse than for better, uh, there continues to be um, a fairly narrow vision of what an effective advocate looks like, sounds like, um, uh, how uh, often he <laughs> and sometimes she um, will, you know, sort of present uh, in, in, in person. Um, and one of the things that I am deeply appreciative of for the senior lawyers who were my models and mentors and sponsors um, as I uh, grew up at, at the firm at Debevoise was that I had a, a real sort of range of, uh, of models, including a number of senior women lawyers, so that mm -hmm. I could see that you could be an effective advocate, an extremely effective advocate, without uh, falling into any of the, you know, kind of the stereotypes or the caricatures, really, of what, for example, a big New York firm lawyer had to look mm -hmm. like and sound like. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think, in many ways, um, eye-opening for me. Because going back mm -hmm. to your original question, you know, sort of why did you, why did I decide to be a disputes lawyer? Um, it underscored for me that I could be a disputes lawyer that was um, in a way that felt natural for me. I didn't have to change the way that I spoke, the way that I um, uh, uh, reasoned, the way that I sounded, <laughs> uh, for example, my accent. Um, uh, I had been cautioned early in my career that perhaps I might want to lose the little bit of accent that I still had. Um, <laughs> and as you can probably hear, I have not followed that advice. <laughs> and it was due in large part to recognizing that in, sometimes the, in some ways, the most effective advocate is somebody um, who has all of the attributes that we might talk about a, a little bit later in the interview, mm -hmm. but can also communicate sincerity and a natural command um, of those skills. Mm. Well, that's very encouraging because I think um, being a dispute lawyer, especially being an advocate, is, is a little bit dramatized. So you look at too much TV dramas and then you feel that, oh, that's the position. And then if I am not that image, then how do I be there? Like there is a long, but yeah, it's really encouraging. Um, so I, I guess, and then my next question is, before Debbie Voice, you worked as, I look at your CV and you worked like an associate legal officer in International Criminal Tribunal for the former uh, Yugoslavia for two years. Can you talk a little bit about your experience um, before you and went into De Debbie Voice? Sure. So um, I went to university in the 1990s. So this is very much dating myself. Um, and at the time, the cutting edge of public international law. So picking up on what I said before, you know, to be where some of the most difficult questions were being raised and resolved and not in the abstract, right? This was international law made very real because mm -hmm. the result was that uh, if somebody was convicted, he, often he, but sometimes she would spend significant time in, a, in, in prison. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the International Criminal Tribunals. Um, so uh, for me, uh, that was, you know, sort of career stop number one. That's where, where I definitely wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I applied uh, the year after I graduated from law school. Um, uh, I kind of 
barely squeaked in in terms of the minimum prior work experience that I was supposed to have um, and because I was so eager to get there as quickly as possible um, and uh, uh, ended up very luckily at the uh, trial chamber that was at the time handling what was you know sort of the trial of the century so this was the trial of Slobodan Milosevic um, uh, an incredible experience for a young lawyer who had dreamed of um, you know sort of being on the cutting edge of public international law um, and I was there for two years um, until uh, uh, Milosevic died earlier than uh, had been uh, anticipated. Um, the uh, trial ended quicker, therefore, than anyone anticipated. And I found myself uh, in New York at Double Voice about six months later. Wow. I can tell you, you're very, at your very young age, you have very clear kind of determination in the career path you're going to uh, do in your life. That's very lucky. <laughs> It, 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 it is lucky, and, and, and again, I, I do want to emphasize, I, I'm in no way saying that if you did not know what you wanted to do when you were 12 years old, even if you didn't know that the career existed, <laughs> <laughs> that is in no way indicative of your future success. Um, okay, I think that um, now we, I want to move to the next uh, section, talking about your current career. Um, my first question is, how did you transit? from a um, well-performing associate to a partner at Debbie Voice. Um, what do you think is the key different, um, um, key different elements or um, capabilities that you need between an associate and a an partner? Cool. Um, so mm -hmm. the, the first thing that I would say is uh, uh, you never do it by yourself. Um, so uh, I see that there are uh, some of my colleagues who are actually attending. Um, so I, I can't see their faces, so I can't see if they're going to be embarrassed when I call them out. But in particular, for example, Deborah Enix Ross, who is a senior lawyer at, at Devil Voice, um, one of my personal heroes and one of the people who kind of guided me through my through my career at Devil Voice. Um, so thank you, Deborah. Um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know, kind of what are the things that can distinguish even a very high performing uh, uh, associate from from a partner? Um, hopefully, that distinction is actually going to be very fine uh, because if you are lucky enough to end up in an environment um, that is supportive, that invests in young lawyers, that trains young lawyers. It is a path of gradually assuming greater responsibility, right? From the, the junior associate who hopefully is a safe pair of hands who can implement when instructions are given to yeah. the mid-level associate who will begin to participate in strategy all the way up to the senior level associate or counsel or you know, sort of whatever the, the, the title is that is applied who will formulate strategy and make a recommendation. The biggest difference sometimes uh, between the partner and the senior associate is that the partner is the one who has to make the decision, right? So that, that responsibility rests with you. Um, yeah. There are, of course, you know, sort of the, the, the range of other uh, tasks and responsibilities of partners in commercial firms with business development, etc. Um, but a lot of it is having the, the, hopefully the confidence, hopefully the experience, hopefully the, the, the support, um, but the buck stops with you. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, hopefully if, if you're in the context where you're not being thrown into the deep end once you make partner, um, then uh, it will have been a gradual process of you uh, uh, learning, gaining skills, polishing those skills, and then practicing them before the training wheels are taken off completely. Did you have this moment that um, maybe the, the first... Uh... The first one or two cases that you have like really personally take that responsibility and then you know, just grow, uh, describe a little bit about your kind of mentality at the time and then what did you feel? <laughs> oh, um, so uh, uh, when, I, when I speak with uh, associates or other young lawyers at the firm, um, I, I describe it as almost learning to embrace the terror, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> The very first time that you uh, are, uh, you know, sort of tasked to do something at, at, mm -hmm. at Devil Voice, we call them stretch assignments. I'm sure they do at other firms as well. Um, it's something that you feel is beyond your immediate grasp. You've never done it before. It's asking something of you that you've never done before. Depending on the context in which that assignment comes, you are the first uh, instinct that you have is sometimes being gripped by terror. Um, so sure, you know, the, the, the first time that 
um, I cross-examined my first witness the first time that I stood up to give oral argument in front of a tribunal, neither of which thankfully was only after I made partner. <laughs> I did both of those <laughs> before I made partner. Um, but the first time that I uh, was, you know, sort of the final voice giving a recommendation to a client, um, uh, not having, you know, sort of the training wheels of a more senior partner around um, is daunting. I, I, again, you do feel this, um, this mm -hmm. sense of responsibility falling on your shoulders, as frankly it should. Um, you know, sort of mm -hmm. we as, as lawyers, as counselors and advisors um, have a great deal uh, uh, of uh, uh, responsibility. We have obligations to our clients. Mm -hmm. You should feel the weight of that. Um, so yes, uh, 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 do I have any um, great stories? Um, uh, there are times when uh, I have um, made mistakes, uh, including before tribunals. Um, uh, one of the uh, uh, best, um, I was actually having a conversation with an associate earlier today who asked me, um, you know, sort of, what do you do if, for example, you're in the middle of a cross-examination and it suddenly goes sideways, or you're in the middle of an oral argument and it suddenly goes sideways? Um, that happens. Uh, it also happened, you know, sort of after I made partner. For those of you who work uh, in teams, you realize becoming partner is not like a magic pill. It does not imbue you <laughs> with, um, you know, sort of the wisdom of the ages and make you, you know, sort of perfect. Um, but one of the, uh, 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 again, sort of wonderful things about working in a team um, is that uh, if you have the support, if you have um, uh, uh, you know, kind of have the team behind you and you've done your preparation, um, you can move on quickly from whatever that, that, that fumble was or, or, or whatever that bubble was. Um, mm -hmm. But I say that because one of the things that I find um, uh, sometimes most challenging for young associates, especially young women lawyers, mm -hmm. is that uh, we held ourselves, we hold ourselves. For purposes of this conversation, I will still call, call myself a young woman lawyer. Um, oh, very we, <laughs> um, we hold ourselves to somewhat, sometimes impossible standards. Mm -hmm. um, and we feel uh, uh, that we have to be the best at something before we volunteer for it. Um, we uh, uh, castigate ourselves. We are sometimes the worst critics of our own performance. Mm -hmm. Um, and it doesn't help if in, you know, sort of settings like this, um, I guess folks like me don't acknowledge that we make mistakes as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that it is entirely possible um, to uh, recover from them, to uh, smooth them over. Um, in some ways, it is the mark of a more mature lawyer um, that you recover uh, and how you recover, not that you never make uh, mistakes in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that was explaining my, my little um, side conversation conversation there. No, I guess it's a very key message there. So if you don't ever step up, you don't make a mistake, then you don't learn faster enough to, to get to the next stage, I guess. Yeah. So I'm very interested in all the first time experience. So can you tell us a little bit about your first experience as an arbitrator? Was it, is it something different from being a counsel when you are the one really have to decide a case who's going to win and who's going to lose? So in some ways, sitting as an arbitrator feels like coming full circle, because as I mentioned, um, you know, so if you start your legal career as a law clerk or an associate legal officer at the tribunal, your job is to review the submissions that come in from the parties and make a recommendation to the judge, and it's the judge who makes the decision. Um, for, I'm not sure if my, my video has frozen, uh, if people can still hear me, can you give me a thumb, some thumbs up, Stella? You can still hear me? Yeah, I can still. A little bit frozen. Yeah, just for a second or okay. so. Um, every so often I get that message from Zoom that my internet connection may be unstable. So if that goes again, please, please do let me know. Um, right, so I was saying that in some ways being an arbitrator feels like coming full circle. Uh, mm -hmm. So in much the same way that I said, in some ways the transition from being a senior associate to a partner is instead of just making the recommendation, you have to make the decision. Um, being an arbitrator uh, is, you know, literally being the judge to whom uh, uh, somebody else made a recommendation before. So yes, in some ways it is a little daunting because you have to make the decision. Um, in others, um, it is, uh, uh, it really does feel uh, uh, 
as a complement really to the role as counsel. Um, mm -hmm. To be effective as counsel, you have to be able to um, assess your own performance, assess the other side's performance, really think about what makes a compelling argument and see how it lands on the tribunal. So mm -hmm. to have those roles reversed, um, you know, sort of the weighing and assessing that remains the same. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you do try to make sure that your assessment of counsel's performance is very distinct from your assessment of the merits of the case, right? Mm -hmm. One should, should not yes, necessarily right. um, affect the other, mm -hmm. um, but it is, uh, a, a, a very weighty thing, again, to be issuing that first decision, issuing that first uh, award, um, mm -hmm. and you take it very seriously. It's not just the risk of being um, uh, set aside or challenged. Um, uh, uh, the parties have come to you to resolve their dispute. They have mm -hmm. placed their trust in you, and that's not something you should take lightly. Mm -hmm. Another, I guess, another significant step in terms of an, as an arbitration specialist like being an arbitrator, complete a bit of that jigsaw. <laughs> exactly, um, you know, again, sort of stepping behind the curtain, so to speak, will, when you go back and act as counsel, I think make you that much more effective as counsel, absolutely. Yeah, I guess you suddenly realize a lot of things which you probably have said before, shouldn't have been said, or maybe said in a different way. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't been um, serving as an arbitrator, but I hope that they will come soon. <laughs> Um, um, next question is, can you tell us about one highlight and one low light of your career, in your career? Oh, um, so uh, the highlight of my career um, in, uh, in international disputes, the highlight of my career is probably, um, I'm actually not going to talk about, you know, sort of awards that we've won. Although they're, they're, those are definitely there and those are um, uh, very much uh, uh, among the highlights. Um, what I would talk about, I, I, I think, would be um, uh, uh, the first time that I uh, successfully cross-examined an expert completely by myself. Um, wow. uh, and I, 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 I know that you had said earlier um, that, uh, you know, sort of uh, this image that people have of examining lawyers from, you know, sort of television, that it isn't always like that. I completely agree. There are times when if somebody had to read the transcript of a cross-examination in a commercial arbitration, it would be the first, furthest thing from a dramatic script. But I actually had one of those dramatic moments. Wow. Um, and it was this, you know, sort of almost like the, 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 the pinnacle of a cross. And and you know, so you're going through the cross and you're building to this moment of drama um, and, the, and it actually happens and it happens in the way that you hope it would happen. Um, and uh, and you, you almost sort of pinch yourself like, you know, does this, did this actually happen? Um, and up until that point, you know, sort of I had been doing the cross by myself, as I said, sort of getting it to that point. And then um, a senior partner at the firm, Donald Donovan, who was sitting to my left, leaning back in his chair, actually, because he was just, he was very relaxed. I was in complete control of, of the cross. And at that point, he realized that I was sort of thinking like, you know, sort of, this actually happened, like this really happened. And he leaned forward and he touched my elbow and he goes, just leave it right there. So that was, it was to sort of just let the drum, let the drama play out, and it, again, it was it was it was this this you know sort of wonderful example of um, uh, uh, what if you are a litigator, you you hope and dream happens, like it kind of makes 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 your heart sing. Um, in terms of a low light of my career, um, losing my first case, losing my first mm. case was but was definitely a, 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 a low a, a low point because you, you second guess everything, right? You, you say, you know, sort of, uh, I should have done something different. Um, you know, maybe if I had, you know, put in one more witness statement or, you know, sort of frame the expert report differently, if I had put in one more submission. Um, mm -hmm. And the best thing that you can do from it is, you know, sort of, again, re-examine um, and, you know, sort of be determined to, to, to do better next time, but also try not mm -hmm. to beat yourself up about it all the time. Because mm -hmm. thinking back on it, all of those successes that I had had, that I had celebrated, there was somebody on the other side who lost. Um, and it, it was not the end of that person's career. To the contrary, I have frequently, this is one of the joys of international arbitration, you frequently mm -hmm. see your colleagues in um, you know, sort of recurring cases. So you know that uh, it is not the end of the world when you lose a case. 
Mm, mm, mm. Very interestingly, what happened to that expert? <laughs> you cross-examined. <laughs> you cross-examined. You broke down. Actually, yeah. I actually don't know what happened to that expert. You're right. I should probably find out. It would make a nice coda to the story. <laughs> but at least for, uh, for, yeah. for the purpose of that dramatic pause, it was enough. Um, my next question is, um, is there anything about your career that you still find as a successful lawyer today, still find it challenging? And if so, what are the tips for you to dealing with all these challenges? Oh, so um, uh, do I find things challenging? Yes. Um, uh, uh, I'll tell a, a tiny little war story here. Um, uh, uh, there's a case that we have been engaged in, you know, sort of litigating for the past eight or nine years. Um, and at different times in the case, we have uh, partnered with very, very senior and respected counsel from different jurisdictions. And in one instance, we were heading into oral argument. Uh, it was a, an early morning in London. Um, and uh, one of the uh, advocates who was going to be arguing that morning, the former attorney general of his jurisdiction, um, and I was at that point, you know, sort of a mid-level senior associate. So one of my jobs was to make sure everybody had what they needed for argument. So mm -hmm. I stopped by and I realized that he hadn't eaten breakfast. And I said, you know, so is everything okay? We can, you know, sort of get you something different. And he said, and he kind of looked at me and smiled and he goes, I never eat before I argue. The butterflies are too large. <laughs> Really, I, you still have, but this is, a, this is a man who, again, pinnacle of his profession, um, had been practicing for over 40 years by that point. And I said, you still get butterflies? And he looked at me again, gentle smile, and said, if you don't get butterflies, you don't care about it enough. So, mm. yes, are there things that I still find challenging and stressful? Of course, I get the butterflies. And whenever I start worrying about, like, you know, I really shouldn't get the butterflies, I remember this exchange that I had mm. um, with, with my senior colleague. In terms of how to deal with stress, um, I, I should have pulled this a little bit closer, but I have um, demonstratives, I have exhibits. Wow. So one of the things that I do when I get very stressed out and I'm preparing for hearings is I spend too much time on keyboards and my hands start to hurt a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, by the time you get to a hearing, it's not as if you can stop preparing, right? You still have to continue going. So what I do instead is I go into hearings and I have exercise balls for my hands. Oh, okay. So that, okay. Uh, when my hands are hurting and I can, I can actually sort of squeeze the balls so that it's, a, it's an exercise for my hand, but it's also, you know, sort of, again, uh, as you know, these are colloquially called stress balls. Mm -hmm. So I can be squeezing these balls and, you know, sort of uh, uh, exercising my hands. And I learned very recently that the last time I did this was in a hearing when I was cross-examining a series of witnesses. And every time, apparently, I took out my exercise balls and started squeezing them, the lawyers on the other side apparently, you know, sort of whispered between each other and said, there she goes again. She's going in for the kill. She has, she has the, the exercise balls. Because apparently the the question is coming. <laughs> exactly. From across the room, it looked like I was clenching my fists. I was so angry um, <laughs> at the witnesses when it was actually the furthest thing from the truth. Um, so all of that being to say, <laughs> there, there is always some, some levity, <laughs> some little bit of, of humor that you can find in the middle of even the most stressful hearing. In the virtual hearings, you can stress it. You can stress no, it as hearing, much as could, you want. I could do it here, but <laughs> this perhaps looks even more, more suspicious than if I just did it on screen. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I have a couple of hearings coming up this year. <laughs> Let us know how you experience. Um, the next question is, what's your plan for the next 10 years of your career? Ooh, um, to get better, <laughs> uh, to continue to get better, to continue to improve, um, uh, uh, to um, you know continue to uh, recruit and train some of the best talent in the field, um, to continue to play a role in uh, uh, increasing. Um, the uh, diversity in our field to mm -hmm. increasing access to our in our field, um, mm -hmm. playing a role hopefully in the development of international arbitration in other parts of the world, um, mm -hmm. uh, any and all of the above. There's a ten years is a long time. <laughs> oh well, I think your answer 
bring us naturally to the next um, next section of my questions. So um, we want to I want to discuss with you a little bit about um, arbitration practice, your skills of advocacy, and then also as you mentioned, diversity issues in international arbitration. Um, you have shared with us a lot of um, your personal experiences being an advocate. Do you have uh, any key messages to tell the young lawyers about what are the characteristics of a e effective advocacy from your perspective? So there are a number of things that go into uh, crafting uh, an effective memorial, um, to crafting effective uh, uh, and being uh, an effective oral advocate. Um, what I think a lot of it boils down to um, is after you have mastered the facts, after you have done all of the legal research um, and you have you know, sort of ascertained and developed the strongest uh, uh, legal foundation uh, with the most compelling authorities um, for, for your case, never forget that the arbitrators are human beings too. And mm -hmm. human beings think in terms of stories. So mm -hmm. the most effective advocacy is often, can you tell a compelling story? Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you are the respondent, the claimant has set out its mm -hmm. story um, uh, of, you know, all of the violations or breaches that you have committed and the basis uh, on, uh, on, on which it can uh, recover. Um, your job as respondent is not just to, you know, sort of poke holes and respond to each one of those arguments. It is to craft a compelling counter narrative, a different mm -hmm. explanation of what happened and why the claimant shouldn't recover or why in some cases why you should recover it's it's that mm -hmm. core job of the advocate to be the storyteller that mm -hmm. i think and i have seen um you know sort of distinguishes good advocates from really good sometimes great mm -hmm. advocates mm -hmm. and that's in both writing and and in oral advocacy there is of course um you know, there are critical distinctions between the two. Um, there's a reason that some people are very good at one and not at the other, but at the core of both kinds of advocacy is this the, this critical uh, task of storytelling. I have a like, follow-up question on that, what we have had. Um, sometimes people say that um, uh, when you argue a case, you, you, have the uh, you, you have the obligation to give the tribunal the full facts of the case. But often when tribunal receiving the cases from two parties, sometimes it's quite quite different from each other. Like as you said, like when, when the claimant has one story and then the respondent have the other story. So how do you how do you manage between telling the full facts and also advocate towards the way that your party uh, supports your supports your party's case? Uh, it's, it's a great question, Stella, and it's one of the places where I have seen even very experienced advocates stumble, I think, um, both either, you know, sort of across the room or um, when I'm sitting as arbitrator. Um, you can't tell a good story that is unmoored from the facts, right? Mm -hmm. we, are, we are still counsel. The tribunal has to make a finding based on the record, right? Mm -hmm. The question is, what is the best narrative? What's the best explanation? What is the best our set of arguments that you can craft given the evidence that you have, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you tell a version of the story that has nothing to do with the evidence uh, in the record, then right. be warned, you have set yourself up for the, your mm -hmm. opponent to step in and say to the tribunal, you shouldn't believe anything that that person has said. And let me tell you why, because they would have you believe one, two, and three, but let's be honest, let's look at the record. The record plainly shows that the facts or the history, or the story is A, B, and C. And look mm -hmm. at it, if you find, as you should on these facts, that it's A, B, and C, we win and they lose. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's actually really important to maintain your credibility um, before mm -hmm. the tribunal, because once that is lost, um, it is nearly impossible to get back. Mm -hmm. That's why we always say that how cred cred credibility is important. Also, I guess advocates and lawyers and also for the witnesses and everyone. Exactly. Um, so, and um, thank you. So my next question is, um, there is much discussion around uh, nowadays about diversity. Um, mm -hmm 
namely diversifying those who's involved in the field of arbitration in terms of gender and culture. Um, what has been in your experience over the years and about how important this topic is in the international arbitration arena? I think it, it is critically important. Um, the legal profession, uh, not just in the country where I live, the United States, but elsewhere, um, uh, is often woefully behind um, uh, other parts of society, other professions, in actually reflecting the societies from which it is drawn, um, uh, reflecting the clients uh, who, who, who bring us matters. Um, mm. And that is uh, not just in the arbitrators who sit, uh, but also the, the council, the lead council, for example. Um, so it is, it remains critically important, I, uh, I believe, very firmly um, for uh, the uh, future of the profession um, uh, uh, to, and, and frankly, uh, um, uh, leave aside the question, leave, leave aside the fact that it, it is the right thing to do, right? <laughs> that you actually should, should, should aspire um, uh, to reflect society, to reflect your clients, etc. Um, it is uh, incredibly short-sighted business-wise um, mm -hmm. if you don't actually seek to identify, develop, and open your profession to the best talent that is out there, regardless mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of background. So where I think the profession has come, um, and we have seen some significant uh, uh, developments, there is still far to go, but we've seen some significant developments in recent years, um, is recognizing uh, the value uh, of, of diversity. Um, and this is diversity, as you mentioned, in different dimensions. So not just gender diversity, uh, not just national diversity, but ethnic diversity and other forms as well. Um, ethnic and racial diversity and other forms as well. Um, not just recognizing that it is something that is valuable, that it is something uh, uh, that we should strive for, but actually beginning to take the steps that are necessary to really achieve it. So it's not just saying the right things, it is beginning to do the work. Um, but as I mentioned, there is quite a lot that remains to be done um, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 a lot of steps and progress that remains to be made. Mm -hmm. Um, and and be, my, my next question is, being a Jamaican national, um, do you think your cultural background and, um, and then the things you have learned when you brought up and have contributed any role in your success, uh, success in your career? Ooh, it's a good question. Um, I think uh, in some ways, um, the fact that I am a Jamaican, a West Indian, I know somebody's going to tell my mother that I was this, and since I mentioned my mother's Trinidadian, I'm not only Jamaican, I am West Indian. Um, being a West Indian who practices outside of her country or outside of her region, right? Um, mm. Because what that means is that I am often very aware of uh, uh, you know, sort of cross-cultural, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sort of practicing, interacting uh, with people across difference. Um, uh, uh, that is, in fact, the reality of my everyday life from the time that I left Jamaica to be a, a student, an international student, um, when I was 16. So what, it, what I think it has done for me um, is to uh, uh, sensitize me um, to uh, cultural differences, to differences of other kinds. Um, uh, uh, it has um, made it easier for me to interact with people of different backgrounds, different nationalities, different languages. Etc. Um, uh, uh, again, because that is sort of my 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 everyday experience, in a way that I think is a distinct advantage when it comes to a cross-cultural, cross-border um, practice uh, the, like the one that we have. Um, there are many other attributes of. Um, people who choose to leave their home country or to live and work in multicultural um, environments. In some respect, we are, we are self-selecting, right? So it is, um, it is uh, 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 a continuing set of challenges that helps you build resilience yes. that can only stand you in good stead for uh, other, uh, other parts of your life, other professional challenges. Wow, yes, yes, I completely agree. I think, um... Nowadays, a lot of more people from different part of the world are starting to look at the international arbitration because it's something, because the business goes international because a lot of Chinese, um, my background and a lot of Chinese companies go international. So I guess, I guess it's a step and that a lot of law students and then people start to get. 
Um, then my, uh, the next question is, what are the biggest changes you have observed in international arbitration practice over your career? Uh, um, when, I, when I first entered the field, uh, uh, there was, um, and you looked at the people who were the leaders in the field, uh, it did seem as if there was this particular image of what you, what you had to look like, what you had to sound like, where you had to come from, where you had to have studied, et cetera, um, to be, to be um, taken seriously, not even sort of to succeed, but to be taken seriously. Um, I think that that has changed. Um, again, if, if you look out, sort of the evidence um, is uh, that uh, those who enter the field, those who stay in the field, um, those who speak and write and um, uh, uh, argue and are appointed to tribunals um, uh, 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 are beginning to uh, reflect the diversity that already exists in the profession. I'm not even talking about the diversity that's in society now. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a, a, a big difference. Um, the uh, explosion of interest in international arbitration outside of the major centers of international arbitration, because mm -hmm. that goes hand in hand, uh, uh, right? That there are um, uh, uh, people from corners of the globe where, to be sure, it's not that there hadn't been disputes there. It's not that those mm -hmm. disputes have not been resolved by international arbitration. It's just that the people who would resolve it by international arbitration used to fly in and do it and mm -hmm. then fly back out. Mm -hmm. um, so that is also, I, 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 I think, a major Major change and, and a welcome one. Um, uh, the increased effort and I think conscious effort to develop young lawyers. So again, the, the expansion in the number of young lawyer organizations and young arbitration lawyer organizations like HK45, um, which is one of the things that I think is critical to the, the, the you know, sort of long-term success of a profession that mm -hmm. will depend on continuing to attract incredibly talented people. Mm -hmm. Then what do you think the trend is for international arbitration for the next, um, I will say, 10 years again? <laughs> Stella, you never ask any easy questions. <laughs> oh, um, I prepared for it. So. <laughs> I, I know. Um, uh, uh, I don't think that there's going to be any single trend. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that perhaps if I had to boil it down to three, um, number one, I think that we will continue to see uh, a fierce debate around uh, arbitration of uh, disputes involving states. Mm -hmm. And I think that the uh, challenges to investor state dispute settlement that we've seen in the last several years will continue to inform the way people see and sometimes again criticize commercial arbitration. So that's number one. Um, number two, um, uh, 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 I think that we will see um, a settling uh, over time of this um, somewhat of a competition among uh, the new arbitration centers. Um, I think in the next 10 years, uh, you will see which ones uh, have, um, uh, uh, for want of a better word, succeeded, right? So those that have attracted users, that um, have gained a reputation, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And third one is, uh, uh, I will say um, uh, in a, in a fit of informed optimism, um, I think the field will continue to get more diverse, more representative. I hope that it will continue to get more inclusive. So it's not just people, different people coming into the field, but actually getting opportunities, getting ahead and succeeding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are my three. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, now I move to the final section and the final section of my interview and about your advice to young, young lawyers and the students. Um, the first question before you give advice to, to young lawyers and the students, I would like to ask you, if you had a chance to give one piece of advice to a younger yourself, what would that be? Wear brighter colors. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I have a slightly more, more serious version of that bit of advice. Um, when I was in law school, uh, I, again, you know, sort of in my 20s, uh, 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 I thought, you know, again, I need to be taken seriously. I need to dress like someone who is taken seriously. So I had a lot of, you know, sort of blacks and grays and very, very, you know, sort of plain neutrals in my closet. And my mother came to visit me and she opened my closet and she 
just kind of looked at it for a while and then turned to me and she goes, you know that we're from the West Indies, right? You know that we love color, right? Um, and again, it was, uh, I, I joke about it's color and fashion, but it was, you know, it, it's, it, it's a broader story about being true to myself, right? Not trying to fit myself into a particularly narrow view of, you know, kind of what, what a successful lawyer or a, a, a proto lawyer, a baby lawyer should look like. Um, so again, my colleagues will tell you that uh, my, co my closet now is a lot more colorful <laughs> than it was when I was in law school. We enjoy your pink today. It's really good. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have a question from online. Um, um, so it fits, fits into my section now. So I just want to um, bring it out to you now. What do you think students of law school focus, uh, should focus on during their time in law school in order to prepare them to become a good arbitration a lawyer in the future? Um, so I'm guessing I don't have to tell you to take international arbitration courses if they are if they are offered. While I and Stella apparently <laughs> didn't didn't take them, um, uh, 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 it is good to take advantage of, of the offerings. So I'm going to interpret the question as beyond that. Um, uh, conflict of laws courses are good uh, because again they will. Uh, 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 um, be very good training for the kind of analyses that you'll do, especially in commercial arbitration. Um, do not discount, particularly if you plan to practice in a, in a commercial setting, in a commercial law firm like I do, um, do not be afraid of numbers. Um, if there are courses that will, uh, you know, sort of introduce you to or expand your knowledge of dealing with financial statements, dealing with just, you know, sort of, again, uh, cross-border trade and investment from the business perspective, not just the legal perspective, uh, take a advantage of that because it will um, help you to understand um, where sources of these disputes come from. You'll be that much more familiar, that much more conversant um, with the uh, the thinking and the, the strategies uh, that go into that. You'll understand where your clients are coming from um, that much better. And you probably won't have to stay up until two or three o'clock in the morning teaching yourself this stuff when you are assigned to the case. Um, again, that is a, a war story of my own, so don't do that. Um, the other thing, the other thing that I would say um, is, if to the extent that you can, if you know that your law study is going to be the last time that you will be in school, um, you know, so it is uh, uh, your your a graduate degree, for example, like it is in the United States, or uh, you know that this will be the end of sort of your your formal training try and save a little bit of the time to do something that is not law. Um, uh, lawyers are better and more effective when they are not just, you know, sort of automatons who spout authority and, you know, kind of um, uh, logical reasoning, but when they have, you know, a, a broader appreciation of, of the outside world. So if you are in a university where you can take a course that is cross-listed from another faculty altogether, I would highly encourage you to do that. It actually will help you be a good arbitration professional um, because you will have a more, a, a, you know, a, a more well-rounded view um, of life, including outside of the law. Mm, yeah, well, very valuable. I, your, your, your advice about um, figures, and I remember that um, there was a joke about um, if lawyers are asked about accounting issues, then they will always say that, oh, well, you know, I do law for a reason. Um, <laughs> I, I guess that doesn't work anymore. You just have to be more divided, and I, I guess. Um, I acceptable. agree. And, and, uh, I, I completely agree. And this is another thing, Stella, where um, unfortunately I've seen it happen far more with women than with men. And again, far more with young women um, who say, I, I don't really understand numbers. Um, do not do that. Do not say that. Um, I promise you, it, 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 it feeds into, I think, uh, ongoing unfortunate stereotypes um, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, even what women lawyers can, can do or, or should not be able to do. So even if you mm -hmm. think that you may not be the most numerate person in the room, please do not say it. Um, <laughs> uh, note it and then decide that it's something that you'll do something about. But do not broadcast that to, uh, to the mm -hmm. rest of the room. It, 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 will, it will not stand you in, in good stead. Any other good advice for female lawyers? Uh... Oh, um, so much. Uh, um, uh, I think, 
maybe I'll try again to kind of boil it down in, 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 into three. Um, uh, <laughs> um, do not expect per perfection of yourself because I promise you that there is a colleague um, that uh, may be sitting beside you or in the office beside you who does not expect perfection of himself and will not let his own self-doubt get in the way. So that's number one. Um, number two, um, uh, confidence is a critical part of, uh, uh, of um, uh, success in the field, um, but confidence isn't um, a shield that you put on. It isn't, you know, sort of a suit of armor that, 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 that you can don at one time. It's built over time. It's built with experience. It's built with, built with practice. Um, mm -hmm. And you have to have opportunities to get that experience and to get that practice. So don't be afraid to ask for it uh, because that's how you get it. Um, so that's number number two. Um, and number three, um, resilience. Do not expect never to fail. This is all why all of my stories of um, failure and losing and mistakes uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's not about whether you get knocked down. Uh, it, it's, it's about how you pick yourself back up. And note, I, I'm presuming that you are going to pick yourself back up, but it's how you pick yourself back up. So those would be, my, would be my three points. Great, thank you. Um, I'm browsing through um, questions online. Let me see whether we can cover some of them. So while you're browsing, I'm seeing that as well. Um, there was a question, what does my average day look like? I wish I knew. <laughs> I, I, I do not have a, a, a single average day. Uh, they vary quite widely and could involve spending a lot of time reviewing and drafting mm -hmm. or speaking with clients or in a hearing. So it's one of the joys of, of the profession that there are many, many different things. Um, uh, and then Kieran had, had a great question about uh, making sure that we're not just considering those who speak the loudest or put their hand up for opportunities. Although you should still put your hand up for opportunities. This is, this is what I just said. Um, but any thoughts on how we can do that more broadly across the profession? Um, this is in part, uh, you know, we spoke about culture. Um, professions also have a culture, right? Um, mm. And uh, this will in part require a little bit of a culture change that frankly I, I, I see already happening. Um, and it, it, it is a result of a, a higher number of entrants from outside sort of the, the, the core centers of, of international arbitration, greater diversity, and therefore a broader understanding of what um, uh, ambition looks like, what drive looks like, what success looks like. Um, so I think if we continue to have that broader understanding that it's not just the person who pounds the table and demands to be given a witness um, in, in a hearing, uh, uh, the, the better that we will be, um, the, the more diverse our teams will be, um, uh, uh, the more um, well-rounded in terms of the range of skills uh, our teams will be. Mm. I see a question about, um, do you have an experience of arbitration in the arbitration center in St. Kitts and Nevis? What are your thoughts about the arbitration practice there? I will confess, I do not have experience of arbitration at the uh, St. Kitts and Nevis uh, arbitration center. I will have to remedy that soon. I'm going to guess that that person is from St. Kitts and Nevis. So feel free to reach out and let me know more uh, uh, about the arbitration center there. Uh, and then I see there was a question, how do you know that you're developing in a way, yes, as a young lawyer, how do you know you're developing in a way that is on pace or on track? For example, how far along in my career was I when I questioned that witness by myself for the first time? Um, I think I was, so the first time I questioned a witness by myself ever, um, I was a young associate, I may have been maybe a fourth year associate, third or fourth year, um, when I questioned a witness by myself for the first time in a major arbitration hearing. I was a, I was a senior associate. Um, uh, the question of, you know, sort of, uh, how do you know that, 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 that you're developing on, on, uh, on pace? Some of that will be um, some discussion with your peers, of course, um, but 
uh, in part, it will be not expecting that there are, you know, sort of distinct milestones. So not saying, well, you know, sort of I've been uh, um, practicing for two years and I haven't done X yet. Um, you do want to get a sense and make sure that you understand the full range of roles. And what you want to be looking for is increasing responsibility over time. Uh, you do also want to have a few of those moments where you feel that you have to embrace the terror, that you get those, the, those stretch assignments. If you're not getting those, if you're not feeling that increased responsibility over time, that's when you can uh, uh, have a sense that you may not be developing on track. And that's when you may want to put up your hand, ask for those other opportunities, or consider whether there are other, other places where you could get other opportunities. Great. Um, I see we're already at 10.02. Um, mm -hmm. I just have one final question to end up our um, an interview today. So this is a game of rapid fire questions. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask you a series, um, series of questions of what's your favorite, and then you can answer me quickly. Without okay. <laughs> um, now I start. What's your favorite food? Anything with chocolate. Favorite movie? The Usual Suspects. Favorite legal drama? Perry Mason. It makes me feel really old, but it's true. <laughs> Favorite holiday destination? Jamaica. Hmm. Favorite fictional character? I don't have a good answer for this one. Um, when, I was a, when I was a child, it was Anne of Green Gables, for some reason. And your favorite animal? I have another demonstrative. <laughs> This is my dog. He is my favorite animal. Wow, hi, hello. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Wow, well, lovely to meet you. <laughs> yes, his name is Guppy. <laughs> my, again, my double voice colleagues will recognize him. <laughs> oh, well. It's a, it's a little late. <laughs> that brings um, us to the end of today's in interview. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie, for joining us. It was a lovely and enjoyable conversation with you. And uh, thank you very much, everyone online. And then um, I hope you enjoyed today's interview. And uh, please do join us for the next episode of HK45 um, Virtual Online um, Fireside Chat. And thanks, thank everyone. You. Bye, Natalie. Bye, Have everybody. Thank you very much.